Hello, my friends. How are you? Welcome to another episode of 30 Albums for 30 Years, 1964 through 1994. I am your host, Jay Sweet. Very excited about today's episode. Miles Davis's ESP Columbia Records recorded January 20th through 22nd, 1965, released August 16th of 1965. Let's get into it. Miles Davis, ESP. So I have not yet featured Miles Davis on this program. A lot of his sidemen, but not yet Miles Davis. So this is the first record of many that will be featured on the program. And I got to tell you, if there was one artist whose catalog I would take with me on a deserted island, you know how people play that game. Well, it would be Miles Davis's uh, for a few reasons. Number one, there's just a ton of material, so I would never get bored. Number two, his style has changed frequently throughout his career. He's a style innovator. So again, never bored. It's just a variety of material. And number three, his sidemen are amongst the greatest figures of jazz, and many of them have gone on to be very successful leaders. So again, great musicianship, never bored. Since this is the first album I've done on Miles Davis, I'm going to give you some biographical detail about the trumpeter. Miles Davis is one of the most influential trumpeters, band leaders, and composers in American history. He was born in Alton, Illinois in 1926. Miles Dewey Davis, his family, enjoyed a comfortable lifestyle. His father, Miles Davis Sr., was a dentist, and his mother, Cleota May, a music teacher. The family also owned a large and successful pig farm in Arkansas. Around the age of nine, Miles Davis got his first trumpet and began taking lessons. And as a youth, Davis's teacher, Elwood Buchanan, discouraged the use of vibrato and insisted that Miles play with a clear and unaffected tone centered in the trumpet's mid-range. In doing so, Davis developed his signature sound and approach. By 1941, the Davis family had moved to St. Louis and Miles began to play in his high school orchestra and marching band. He also began to take a serious interest in music theory, and he was developing quickly as a musician. While still in high school, Davis played with several territory groups and absorbed everything the St. Louis jazz scene had to offer. Graduating high school in 1944, Miles Davis spent part of his summer as a fill-in with the Billy Eckstein Orchestra, a group that also included Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, and Art Blakey, all future jazz legends. Determined to get to New York, Miles Davis began studying at the Juilliard School. While he was being given a classical education in the classroom, he became more interested in the New York jazz scene and spent most of his evenings jamming at Minton's and Monroe's in Harlem. After only three semesters at Juilliard, Miles Davis dropped out of the school and focused on working as a jazz musician. By 1945, Miles Davis emerged as one of the top trumpeters on the New York scene. He began first by playing with musicians like Coleman Hawkins and Eddie Lockjaw Davis, and even recorded as a leader with his own Miles Davis sextet. When Dizzy Gillespie left Charlie Parker's quintet in 1945, Miles Davis joined the group. The shift from Gillespie to Davis was surprising, especially since Davis's playing vastly differed from Gillespie's. Although Davis made significant attempts to match Gillespie's fiery style early on, he simply could not play with Gillespie's same technicality and range. To separate himself from Gillespie, Davis began to incorporate more space into his solos and focused more on texture and tone than technicality. He also began to use a mute, which helped to give Davis a signature sound. Miles Davis regularly worked with Parker over the next two years and was now being further recognized for his unique sound and jazz approach. In 1947, Davis recorded again as a leader with the Miles Davis All-Stars. The recording is notable because it features some of Miles Davis' early compositions. Additionally, it is one of the few recordings showcasing Charlie Parker not on the alto saxophone but on the tenor sax. 
By 1948, Miles Davis was moving away from bebop and began exploring the possibilities of playing in a more orchestrated style known as cool jazz. In the early 1950s, Miles Davis began struggling with heroin, and by 1953, he was completely strung out. His struggles were now publicly known, and the trumpeter was flirting with disaster. In response, he returned to his parents' home in St. Louis and quit heroin cold turkey. Physically and mentally stronger, Miles Davis returned to New York and the jazz scene in 1954 and shifted his playing style to incorporate a greater use of space and direction. In July of 1955, Miles Davis made one of the greatest public comebacks when he was showcased as a guest at the Newport Jazz Festival. He then formed his famed first great quintet with John Coltrane on tenor sax, Red Garland on piano, Paul Chambers on bass, and Philly Joe Jones on drums. Although there were some lineup interruptions due to the group's drug use, the band performed and recorded classic albums between 1955 and 1959. And when not recording with that group, Miles was releasing some more cool orchestrated works with arranger Gil Evans. In the early 1960s, Miles Davis struggled to keep a steady roster. During the interim period between 1960 and 1963, Miles Davis's group at times included saxophonists like Hank Mobley and George Coleman, pianist Wynton Kelly and drummer Jimmy Cobb, all fine musicians. By 1963, Miles Davis began forming a new, more youthful quintet. Joining the group in 1963 was 17-year-old drummer Tony Williams, 23-year-old pianist Herbie Hancock, and 26-year-old bassist Ron Carter. In 1964, 31-year-old Wayne Shorter solidified the lineup as the tenor saxophonist. This new lineup of the second great quintet would remain intact till Miles Davis shifted his direction to explore more electric music in 1969. By the time the second great quintet began in 1964, Miles Davis was a seasoned veteran at 37 years old. The injection of more youthful players seemed to inspire Miles Davis, and together, the group developed a connectivity and a style that explored elements of free jazz. Free jazz concepts eliminated some more restrictive playing. Now, while there were more free elements associated with Miles' new direction, the trumpeter never fully accepted free jazz and kept within the tradition of playing prepared tunes with defined chord structures. But they did so in a way in which the rhythm section played with a certain rhythmic elasticity that moved beyond the more formalized swing or bebop traditions. Another aspect of the band was that instead of presenting more standard materials, the group would present original works. Since Miles Davis, Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock, and Ron Carter were all gifted writers by this time, the quintet had a wealth of material to draw from. In many cases, Miles would collaborate to help shape the compositions of his sidemen. And in their five years as a working unit, the second great quintet would reshape jazz. Okay, let's talk about the album. ESP is significant because it is the first studio release of Miles Davis's second great quintet, which signified a new, more modern direction for Miles after the breakup of Miles Davis's first great quintet. Not everybody loved Miles Davis's new direction. Famed trumpeter Kenny Dorham reviewed the album in the December 1965 issue of Downbeat Magazine and commented, he said the following, emotionally as a whole, this one is lacking. It's mostly brain music. This type of music has that drone thing that I don't like, but because of the almost flawless presentation, I give it five stars, but only four stars for the writing and the effort, and no stars for the overall sound. ESP's music is generally monotonous, one long drone. 
Another interesting note is that ESP was recorded at Columbia's Hollywood Studios following a fallout between Davis and producer Tio Macero after the release of Quiet Nights. It was the last album bearing a photo of Davis's then wife, Frances, on the cover, and the couple would separate by the end of 1965. Miles Davis was married three times. Okay, off to the music. Let's check it out. Thank you. 